Oh, that's beautiful. Well, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to my garden here. Well, I'm under the conservatory, actually. I had this conservatory put at the back of the house about 10 years ago. It was the set for a TV show for Channel 5 called Garden ER. And uh, it's amazing. The reason that we've done it here, because it's so hot out there, and I get a little bit because the, there's uh, an element of covering on the roof that gives me a bit of protection, the polarised, I think. And that's how it works. So welcome to my garden again. We've been doing a lot of filming here. For those of you who watched uh, Love Your Garden, our Grow Your Own uh, version with Alan Titchmarsh that went out on Monday. And we were surprised because it was a Monday evening and it was uh, a bank holiday and the weather was great. I didn't think anybody would be inside watching the TV, but we had millions, millions of viewers. So thank you if you did watch for enjoying the show. We got loads of other great activities taking place. In fact, we're filming tomorrow just at the back there where my greenhouse is uh, with more activities. And it's so nice. I, I said to Alan, it's so great when we do a creation or something similar that we're not going back to a hotel afterwards. I can just walk from the back garden into my kitchen just here for a bacon butty. And that's always the plus. Big thank you to Evergreen and the team there. And of course, the Levingtons and Miracle Grow and the many other wondrous brands that have kindly uh, uh, brought this uh, production to you. And I'm going to be highlighting some things that may help you in your garden. I'm going to tell you what my family are doing in the garden, give you some hints and tips on other things as well to hopefully inspire you to do some activities with your family as we get back. Because although lockdown is lightening up a little bit and we're all still being so very cautious, there is great activities in the garden for you to enjoy yourself, whether it's self-indulgence, whether it's with your partner, or whether it's with your children. That aspect of connecting with nature makes us feel happier. And I'm so, so great you can join me here in my garden, or under my conservatory, to give you an idea of the type of things that, that we're doing. Because the weather has been phenomenal. Phenomenal. Talking to Francis, Katie and Alan, I'm saying the one thing is, is we, we have to water all the time to keep things alive. And it's not like, you know, we do a show and then we, then we leave it. This is our gardens. If we let anything dry out, the cameras will pick that up the following week and it'll be seen by millions. So I've got <laughs> irrigation, well it's irrigation, it's an oscillating sprinkler, down in the Grow Your Own area watering all the time. Um, and if you want some hints and tips on watering, my column in the Daily Express tomorrow highlights a load of those uh, activities and how you can make the best of watering in your own garden. And if you'd like a, a garden with plants that are specific to beneficial health, you can read my pages, double page spread in the Sunday Mirror. So there's loads of things happening. But here, right now, for you, with Evergreen, I'm going to be talking about, firstly, getting kids involved with gardening. Then I'm also going to talk about soil conditioning, something that I particularly love because the soil is a living and breathing thing. And then I'm going to give you some hints and tips on uh, pruning as well, which is very poignant uh, at uh, this time of year. Plus, we'll take a look at some of your Chelsea moments, some of the many photographs that you kindly sent in to us showing something that's beautiful in your own garden. I was extremely touched by many of those. And we've got a bit of a prize giveaway and all sorts of other things. So for those of you who've watched uh, the TV, which shows uh, our own lives, uh, Alan and Alison at uh, his garden, uh, then there's Francis and Katie with their other halves, and I'm here uh, with Adele with my children as well that you get to see on the show, you'll realize I've got a bit of a hands full. I've got Alice, who's five years old. I've got Abby, who's four years old, and little Lance, uh, who only recently turned one. So three kids under six in lockdown. Whew. Well, we're, we're working our way through it. Um, and we do loads of activities outside, as you can see in the show. So I thought I'd share with you some activities I'm doing with my kids, but also to highlight older age groups as well. So you really get the youngsters, anything from one up to about five or six, then you get from five or six, perhaps up to about eight, and then it's eight into teens and teens themselves. And each of them have a different interaction with nature and the garden. So I thought if I give you a, a range of activities around each of those, it should hopefully, you'll find one or two that you can use with your own children or grandchildren in your garden space or your grandparents' garden space, as the case may be. Because Getting kids involved with gardening is essential. And we've always got this almost wrong assessment of what gardening is. 
Because gardening isn't just about weeding, watering and cutting the lawn. You know, gardening is about relaxing in the garden. It's about the barbecue. It's about the, the outside Jenga, the water pistols. You know, it's the scent of honeysuckle in the air. It's 10 minutes at the end of the day with a glass of wine or a cold beer and just enjoying the majesty of it. And that's really what I want to instill into children, that gardening isn't a hard work job. It isn't all about labour and doing stuff. It's about playing, it's about imagination, and it's about enjoying the great outdoors. So start your kids early off if you've got very young children. We'll, we'll start from the young and work our way up to the teens, if that's all right with you. In that gardening is play. I love this one. This, is, this has been used for a few of the kids on the way. Um, it is a kid's lawnmower, quite authentic really. So they, they love to mimic. The thing about gardening, it's about play as well. And that's what you've got to get through. Um, so when you're mowing the lawn, the kids can be mowing it behind you as well. That's still going. And likewise, other little things, it's about play. You know, it, it, <laughs> this is Abigail's. You can tell it's Abigail. It's got the sharks on it. She's, she's as hard as nails. Where well, they're pulling carts, we, we use these to go and crop some of the grow your own area. Alice is uh, a little softer, it's frozen. So they play and, and, and that's part of it, is when you're gardening, it's, it's about engaging. So they like to do, as you know, what mummy and daddy does. So cutting the lawn, their own wheelbarrows and their own tools as well. I'm loving these. Can't remember where I got these from now. Look, it's a trowel, a fork and a rake, but look, the duck's heads. I'm going to be using some of these on Love Your Garden. How cool is that? And that's it. It's playing. They have their own tools with it. They're playing with what they've got. There's little carrier items that they can put pots and containers. Uh, there's their wellies because it's about dressing up as well, isn't it? And you know kids enjoy dressing up. And that's where it goes. But of course, there is a safety aspect that runs with it as well, especially with this heat. Making sure there's plenty of sun lotion. It's not just for the kids, it's for us too. And for those of you who are aware, I'm one of the ambassadors of the Melanoma Fund that has a campaign, Watch Your Back, which is encouraging all people that work outside or engage in outdoor pursuits to make sure that they're properly covered with sun cream because there's a huge rise in skin cancers at the moment. So make sure yourself and your kids are well covered. And of course, things like the gloves that they can use whilst in the garden and of course a hat as well to protect them too. And let their imaginations go wild. Because if they're dressing up and they're doing stuff like mum and dad does, it gets them associated with the garden so very early on. Well, that's what, that's, what my, that's what my lot are doing anyway. And of course, give them a patch of ground because the younger the kids, that interaction with soil, mud pies or everything works. And if you've got a, a little patch of the ground outside, well, you can, you can almost imagine it because you know what kids are like with sand pits, and the digging and whatever. You can have an area where you've got soil uh, or compost, uh, peat-free compost in a, in, in a board or something similar to that for them to play. But always double check there's no sharp uh, thorns or, or, or stones or any, any objects within the soil. We normally use this, these old, group, these old um, wheelbarrows. Now I picked up that, you know when you go to your local tip, they've got a little section in there that some of the guys pull, guys and girls pull some of the stuff out that isn't, you know, too bad, shouldn't be going in the tip, can be reused again and they sell the items off um, for charity. I think this one here was about a fiver or something similar to that. So you, you pay your money or you donate a bit more, whatever you want to do. Um, and we've got a couple of these for our girls. Alice and uh, Abigail have got them and they plant them up. Um, and it changes with the season. So you can plant bulbs in some. Uh, here, what we've got there, I think this one's Abby's. Uh, she's got some moss in there. She painted up a little, fa <laughs> look at, painted up a little fairy arch as well. Um, and there's flowering plants that work in there, and a little bean. Because when we were doing the story, Jack and the Beanstalk, apparently, according to one Sky um, News interview, they reckon Jack and the Beanstalk goes back 5,000 years as a tale, but they've recorded some of them about 300 years ago. It's a really old fairy tale, I remember it. But the kids can see it grow, because it's quite a, a fast-growing plant in itself, right up to the top, and that's it. Because you want them to play as well. It's not just about the activity and seeing nature grow, uh, what have we got here? Rhinoceros. <laughs> a horse, of course. They love horses, the girls. Stegosaurus, often found in wheelbarrows up and down Warwickshire, I hasten to add. <laughs> and, and then they can play. 
It's marvellous. If you've got an only child, let their imagination go. If you've got a couple of kids, they can have a barrow each and, and there's a little competition between them. But playing with plants and gardening, and it's a perfect height, barrows, for kids having a go, that's really great. So getting the younger ones, the under five and six engaging in gardening activities of dressing up, of having tools like mum and dad, having a safe space to be able to, uh, to plant it works. Best thing about them wheelbarrows, once they've finished, you can wheel them off into another area where the rain can look after them if we get any, and you can maintain them with your other pots and containers. It's so easy to do and, you know, next to nothing. Uh, and of course, you can get plenty of compost. It is the type of stuff that we've used here. It's the um, Miracle Peat Free, which is ideal in those type of environments because it's not like you're digging soil from the ground. You can use something soft and safe in that respect. Now, Kids that are, say, six up to uh, nine or something similar, where there's a great deal more dexterity in their hands and they're wanting more challenges, sowing seeds. Um, I mean, let's be straight. You can sow seeds at any age, you know. And I still remember the first time I did it. It was at school and it was, uh, a, it was a bean with blotting paper and a jam jar. And you press the bean to the glass of the jam jar, put the soil in, so you could see it grow as, it, as its top and base starts to grow into the area. And that, that, that element of excitement, you know, 40 years I've been in professional horticulture, I still get when something germinates in my own greenhouse. So it, it's great. Uh, eggshells are perfect for it. Get yourself an eggshell. Put a little bit of, uh, uh, there we are, the peat-free compost in. Sow some seeds within it. It can be a lot of different seeds. It can be grass, it can be cress, it can be uh, salad, whatever. Uh, and then it'll germinate. A bit of compost. Here we are. Oh, look, we've even put some cheeky little eyes on it and a smiling face. This one's got a ponytail. This one here, uh, what have we got here? I'll have to, to balance it up. I don't know whether you can get it. And that, that one here has just got general stuff. But aren't they great? It doesn't have to be grass. It, it's just, you know, do it for yourself. It's so much fun, let alone the kids getting involved. We did some here with, with salad. Here's one. He's looking a bit nervous. And there's another one. He's got his tongue out. And whilst they germinate and grow, of course you can take these out of there and grow them in their own little wheelbarrows, if you like, or other pots. But it's just fun. But a real good one is, is cress, of course, because once you get that germination, here's a couple here, you, of course, you can make up, you know, a really nice scrambled egg sandwich, a bit of cream in there, lovely chop off the crest for a bit of bite into the sandwich as well. And it's about fun, germinating. You don't have to do them in eggshells. You can do them in pots and containers. Here's the big one. Get hold of some tights. Um, then you can put uh, uh, compost in the tights. And then you can sprinkle at the top as you lift the tight up some, some grass seed. And then you can make these. Dun, dun, dun. Look at these slugs. Now, they've still got to go. They've started to germinate. And, of course, they grow through the tight, uh, the holes in the tights. And uh, they can also decorate them up with a few. This one's got one eye. <laughs> and this one's got little ears. It's great fun for kids. It's germination. It's nature. It's a skilled activity. I think it really works. Now, not all of the seeds are germinated here. We just got some of them to germinate beforehand. With, and it, it'll be a huge, hairy mess as that continues to grow which is great. So for that age where they're slightly older, germinating seeds, you can do these with younger kids as well, of course, you can do this in all ages. Um, but these are really good activities because the kids can track and make notes of the dates they first saw life and how they've grown and everything. Of course, painting works well too. A simple stone in the garden can be transformed. Now you can do it in a whole host of different ways. Uh, we've got one here where, where it's a, suddenly become a little bee. And of course, as you're getting the kids to paint, you can teach them at the same time. I mean, bees are marvellous. They can fly up to five miles to collect. I've got honeybees in some of the hives just over the other side of the garden. Um, they're fascinating creatures. Flying five miles so they know just how much fuel to take to get them to the, uh, um, the right plants and back again. They communicate each other with interpretive dance. They call it the waggle dance as bees are talking to each other. They can identify electromagnetic uh, 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 thunderstorms and the like so they can stay out of the way. They uh, are marvellous creatures. And you don't have to just be about bees. You can also transform. Here's a little ladybird. It's about creativity. 
It's about fun, it's about imagination. And they can settle these into their little wheelbarrows. Here's a cheeky frog. But they're good. And you can do the same about, because I have do these with stones as well. Paint the stone white, and then you can actually use it as a plant label, if you've sown seeds. In fact, you could take normal corks like this, paint the corks, and they make perfect plant labels. The only problem is, of course, if your kids have got lots of different varieties, you've got to supply them with quite a few corks. Hmm. So there we go. With a lot of the kids, it's, it, it, it's element of the over sixes, two tens, where there's a little bit more skill level, flair with creative art, either through stones or for creating planters for their seeds or having a bit of fun are really good. Now, the next stage, of course, is teenagers up. And we've got the biggest battle. Because when I was a kid, if I did something wrong, I was told to get to my room as a form of punishment. Nowadays, it's a bonus for the kids because they're straight up to the room on the iPads, on the iPhones, on the plasma screens, on the computers. Who would have thought it? 10 years ago, these were the mobile phones that were about. And what could you do with them? Make phone calls. Now, they're a sat nav, you can shop on them, you can communicate, there's, there's a whole host of activities, it's too tempting. What we've got to do is try and tap into the teenager's psyche and the current mood around the world with climate change, uh, the plight of the bees and nature. It's a huge, I don't know, it's a topic of passion, not just for us, but for the younger children as well, especially teenagers. And connecting them with nature, giving them the opportunity to engage and support the planet goes a long way. Now, the first thing you want to do is actually give them their own plot of land to control. Maybe in the garden, a square bit. Give them their bit of the planet for them to make a difference. And if you haven't got it, just give them a bag of compost. Because have a look down here. What I've got is I've just taken the standard bit of compost. I did this for ITVs this morning, um, about three weeks ago. And it's all grown, so I thought I'd, I, I'd show you. Um, so what we did is I just cut out squares and we planted it up. And this is perfect for teenagers because all these plants here, great for the bees. Everything. They're tac tac tactile as well, so you get the, 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 the scent of, of the catmint, to the curry pan, to the, of the sage, of chives, that strawberries at the top. There's a little thyme. Oh, beautiful. And the bees will love this. And the insects that come with it, the butterflies, the smallest space. But listen, they've got to have an involvement. The key thing with any uh, of the teenagers, take them to the garden centres. Let them choose what they want to grow in their plot of land. Because that ownership is key to get involvement. And if they're germinating, they can germinate things in their own bedroom windowsill. So they can do it nice and comfortably in the old dry. Then they come out and plant them. It instills a great deal of almost... I don't know, nurturing, parental attitude. So they start to care for what they've got to because they are controlling a part of the planet themselves and engaging with nature, which is hugely topical at the moment. Don't underestimate the different senses in use. Things like the sense of smell, particularly. Oh, that's sage. I love that. Chopped with a little bit of butter over the top of ravioli. Mwah! Gorgeous. Lavender. Thyme I've mentioned before, strawberries, and this is really good. Uh, this is a blackberry that can grow up and it's thornless as well. So it's perfect. So they can grow, they can pick it fresh, drop it into the yogurt in the morning, eat it, it's gorgeous. So engaging with teenagers with things that they have an ownership with, they have pride and control, and something that adds on to their sensory experience is great. Now that's a lot of ideas. From the youngsters right the way up to the older ones, Getting kids involved with gardening is key. That's what I do with mine, and you get to see that every Monday on ITV1, uh, 8.30. That's the one, so don't forget to join us. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about soil conditioning. Let me just bury myself comfortably here in compost and manure and bark chip as well, because I love soil. I'm often asked, what is the thing that I like living most in my garden because there's a lot of living things of course there's us as humans there's our insects uh, maybe fish in the ponds there's our birds our amphibians there's a whole host of our mammals as well hedgehogs and there's so much 
but the soil's alive too. The soil is alive. There's more life, microorganism life, in one handful of soil than there are humans on this planet. And the soil is a living, breathing thing. So normally when you, I don't know, you feed plants with miracle Grow or, 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 um, or a whole host of other different fertilisers, you are feeding the plant specifically, but we need to feed the soil as well. And feeding the soil is not just about the um, nutrient level within there, it's also giving the soil the ability to hold on more moisture, it's giving the soil the ability to have air within it and dry places for these uh, microorganisms to live. It's archaea and algae and, and bacteria and fungus and protozoa, all of it alive in the soil, just to name a few. So by looking at your borders, whether you're growing fruit or vegetables or even your flower borders, putting something into the soil gets it healthy. And if it's healthy, you get less disease on your plants. Plants find it easier to be able to absorb both moisture and, of course, uh, nutrients as well. And you have a healthy garden and better production. And that's how it works because it also helps other, uh, uh, not just plants, uh, other creatures that are in your garden live and thrive. So here's a bit of a guide. The first thing, anything that you can add into your soil is organic matter. Doesn't need sprays, doesn't need pellets, it's, it's organic matter. Now, you can either, and you, you'll see it a lot, farm your manure, bags for sale in laybys or by the side of farms or whatever, that's great, get it into your garden. You may also have your own compost heap. Again, once that's produced, you can dig it into your garden. Or even collect up the leaves in autumn from your garden, put it into a bag, and leave it to rot down behind the garage or shed and then use that leaf mould about 6 to 12 months later and dig that into your soil and that works. Alternatively, you can buy it. Um, this is the Levington one here, organic blend, farm yarn manure. There, let's, let's have a look at it. What have we got in here? Whoa, that feels good. And it's in compost. There we go. Now adding that into your soil and digging it in is perfect and you can do that anytime. In fact, if you dig it in in autumn as the frost expands and contracts the soil, it works it in, but digging it in now really does well. It helps, soil, helps the soil condition and helps the microorganisms too. So adding it in, and of course it's all bagged, so it's easy to handle, it's not smelly, it's perfect for adding into your borders. Of course, it's anything that adds a little bit of fibre within there. Your old grow bags that you finish with, you can dig that soil back in. If you haven't got organic matter and you've got just a little bit of compost left over, you can dig that into the soil as well. But bark chips also help because bark chips are really on the surface. Let me pull this out. Where have we got? You know, every time I smell this, I think of either Chelsea Flower Show or Hampton Court because it's what we use at those shows where we've got a bit of ground that might have been a bit muddy or some of the turf has been, lorries reversed over it. We use bark chip to cover over and that smell of this bark always reminds me because the days before the flower shows open, everything smells of bark because we're just tidying up the areas. But it's beautiful. You add that onto the surface of the soil. For a start off, garden looks immediately great because it's almost like cushion covers really for your, uh, for your soil. But of course, it suppresses some weeds. It helps retain moisture within the border as well. It doesn't evaporate as much. And of course, it slowly breaks down and becomes organic matter and works its way in. But there are other types of um, soil conditioners you can add. If you are planting roses or trees or shrubs, there's a rose tree and shrub. Um, I suppose it's a premium soil conditioner, soil compost. So as you dig your holes, you can line the hole with this compost, it's perfect. It contains nutrients, it adds a little bit more air into the soil as well. It can be easily re-wet so it absorbs some of the moisture in. It just, it's rooted in science. So what it does is in fact it gives your plants the best opportunity for an early start. So the roots aren't growing into stone, compacted clay or anything. It's a comfy cushion into this lovely rose tree and shrub uh, uh, compost. So it's a really good start for those plants as well. Now, if you've got good borders and I don't know, you want to treat it. You want to give it a bit of a boost to create some more nutrients in there. Again, there you can use the border booster. It's a soil improver, really. It just adds a lot into it. So you can just cut the bag, 
tip it out and lightly fork over the surface and you're putting that goodness into the soil. And as much as you can invest into the soil, it will pay you back tenfold. So that's border booster and that's a soil improver. That's really great. Now, if you are building new borders, uh, you might be able to do this by raised beds out of sleepers or you've created a rockery and you wanted to, to bring some more soil in to mound it back up. Basically, you want more soil in the garden. Topsoil is great. Uh, Levingtons have uh, an organic blend topsoil, so it's completely free of weeds. It's the highest grade stuff that you can get. You don't need a massive lorry dropping it off at the back. You can buy it all pre-bagged and it has everything that you need to create new borders or add more soil into the garden. And finally, uh, for those who suffer from either very sandy soils, uh, which get dry very quickly, or those who've got very heavy soils that, uh, that's full of clay, you really want a soil conditioner, something that you can dig in to add a little bit more structure to the sandy soils and to break up a little bit of those heavy clay soils as well. As much effort and time that you can put into your soil, everything else in the garden will help support that and you will be supporting plants and your microorganisms to invest in your soil. Okay, let's have a look at some pruning activities as we go and then I'm going to go and show you some of the pictures you kindly sent in for your own Chelsea moments of what you've got in your own garden looking good at the time. I often get asked and still do now funnily enough, I'm not sure whether something's alive or dead in the garden. I'm going to prune this down but I've been waiting for it to come into leaf. I've got to say if we're now nearly in June and it hasn't come into leaf it's not looking pretty good for the plant but there is a test you can do so you're a hundred percent sure. So I've got two uh, branches here and uh, one of them's alive and one of them's dead. Okay, uh, it's an easy test you can do. You need to have something, it costs 10 pence. It is 10 pence. And you can actually scrape away a bit of the bark. So I'm gonna do it just about here so you can see. So if you scrape away on this one here, and you can see it's quite dry underneath and dark. Well, as if I scrape this one here, you can see it's light and there's some green in it as well. So that is a sign that there's some life still there, there's some moisture, whether this one here is just completely dead. And that's a really good test. Often better done earlier on in the year. If in doubt, don't prune until you're absolutely sure that there's no life left in there. But it's a, it's a trick that we, we use when I've, well, I've worked in nurseries, uh, growing plants for a long period of time. It's a great way to test. Now, why do we prune? Uh, listen, I've got to say one thing before we go on to the next is hedge trimming. Okay, Hedge trimming is a type of pruning because, of course, you're manicuring those in. The RSPB really do ask for our favour here of not pruning very dense hedges or anything where there may be nesting birds. Please, wherever you can, uh, prune either very early on in the season before nesting birds, well before March, or a lot later on into uh, August and after. Or if you, if you do, you need to check the hedges. But please, follow the RSPB's guide sign. You can take a look at it at rspb.org.uk uh, if you want more information from that. Uh, it's a marvellous organisation and there's much we can do to protect our uh, birds, our visiting birds in Britain. Please do so. But... Um, if you are pruning uh, anything from uh, uh, plants that have overgrown in the garden, and we prune people back, prune them back for that, or if we've got any large trees that are, are putting too much shade in the garden because we do need a little bit of sunlight to come through, everything benefits from a bit of extra sunlight. Uh, not only our plants, but our wildlife that visit the garden. So you can give a prune there. Now the secret with any pruning is also when you are cutting, uh, you, you'll find out where we call we call it a node in the business. It's really where there's a bud, and as you can see, this is I've just clipped this from one of our uh, one of my apple trees just over there. Um, you can see where the plant is growing because buds face in different directions. Okay, so if I cut to that bud there, the branch will grow that way. If I was to cut to that bud there, it'll grow that way. So there's another bud there, it'll grow that way. So if you cut to a bud, wherever it faces, that's the direction of the next growth. So if I wanted to cut to that branch there, I do that cut like that. And that grows out in that direction. And the secret is, is to cut at an angle away from the bud. Okay, so you cut it like that, away from the bud, so the water doesn't nestle in the bud 
and rot. And that's the best way to prune. If you're pruning trees and the like, think, seems a bit of a wine theme here with the corks and everything. Think of a wine glass. Basically, you are pruning out anything that crosses in the middle and comes slightly entangled. So you want them really open and out like that, trees and the like. So first of all, it's cut out the three Ds. Dead, diseased and damaged. Cut those out straight away. And then really prune to shape. That's with a lot of things because if we're cutting back, I know really summer isn't, isn't the key time to, to give a hard prune, but if things are overgrowing and they're competing for space and you need to do it, prune. You'd be better off in many cases to prune badly than in some cases pr not prune at all because you get that little bit density. Not all plants, usually with, with things like evergreens, there needs to be less pruning, the more structured plants. But anything that's producing a lot of growth, you prune usually, certainly at this time of year, after flowering um, to give it, a, give it a chance. And early on in the year, you've, you'd be better to make sure that anything that's holding buds or flowers, that you're not pruning out those flowers. So wait till, wait till afterwards. So pruning in the garden is about trimming plants, removing dead, diseased and damaged by proportioning or balancing plants and to stop an element of competition in borders thinning out because we need that extra space to make a difference. Let's take a look at some of the pictures. I'm dying to show you these. We've been made up with them looking at the, the shots. Some of the beauty that you've shown. I, I don't know how best to show you. I might as well just come uh, 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 over here and give you an idea. Some beautiful examples, a lovely picture. Please share more pictures with us. We really love them on that part. Helen, what a beautiful red rose. It looks like the front of a greeting card, doesn't it, on, on Valentine's Day. How beautiful. Jenny, your hostas, watch out for them slugs. They don't like this dry weather, but as soon as we start getting some rain, they'll be over those babies. Uh, Louise, how gorgeous. And Nikki, well done on that one. The peony looks gorgeous. What else have we got there? A lot of roses. David, oh, I like these. And it's the fragrance, isn't it? The fragrance, David, that goes with it. Kaylee Graves, look at that pergola. Dripping there with uh, wisterias and the alliums. It's like Chelsea. You've got a, what a lovely garden. Uh, Vanessa, what have we got here? Mixed one for Vanessa. I can't see them too quite clearly. It looks as if you've got, forget me not, I love them. My gran had them in her garden. I really like them. Donna, I really like the marguerites and the daisies there. Andrew, gazinias there. Clemet, oh, Clematis there, Eileen. Very nice Eileen, I really like that. Emma Nixon, another rose. Priscilla, another rose as well. We love our roses. I've got a couple flowering just over, I can't switch the camera around, but I, I had that about five years ago. Every time I see it in flower, it brings a smile to my face. Oh, irises, Louise, how beautiful. Kerry Jones, what have we got? Looks like poppies here. Uh, Delith, we've got a lovely rhodos. Love rhodos, uh, some of my favorites. Kevin here, some grow your own there. That's looking good, giant cabbage. Kev, you're doing well on that one. Tom, nice banana, mate. Look at that, look at that, banana starting to flower. He's in East Yorkshire. You're doing well, mate. Dawn Holden there. Lovely, lovely dwarf rhododendron in a pot there. And uh, Andy, is that, is that Scotch bonnet you're growing there? Those chilies, that'll be nice on the pizza. Emily Moss is lupins, they're going well. I can see mine coming into flower over at the back. Keely there, oh, beautiful flowers. And uh, what have we got here? We've got Sophie here, look at that. There's a picture of her and her mum. Going to Chelsea Flower Show, it's a virtual Chelsea Flower Show, but um, you, can, uh, you can still enjoy. But look at this one here, Sue Brown. Look at that, it looks like Chelsea, Sue. Amazing. In fact, Sue, you're the winner there. We're going to send you off some miracle Grow uh, uh, Performance Organics all-purpose compost that will be coming to you. And thanks, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't show them all, but we really enjoy taking a look at some of your pictures there. So send us some more in, please do. Now, we've got a competition for next time. Um, so any questions that you've got, please send your questions forward. Uh, the details where to send them is in the description of the post here on Facebook. Um, so send them through and I'll, I'll answer some of your questions. And we will give away to one of the questions, be, uh, Miracle Grow, Azalea and Camellia and Rhododendron Ericaceous Liquid Feed. And listen, if anyone gets a chance to germinate a few of their own in unusual heads with grass, uh, in uh, eggshells or anything else, send us in the pictures and I'll show a few of them next week as well. Big thank you very much to Evergreen um, who uh, uh, look after brands like uh, Levington's and Miracle Rose, the big, big players for bringing this broadcast. Thank you very much, guys. We do appreciate it. You can join me 
on Friday the 12th of June at 1 o'clock and I'll be covering sensory gardenings, everything from touch to taste to smell to sight and to hearing as well. How you can maximise your garden with every sensory experience. I've really enjoyed talking to you here today and uh, I look forward to chatting to you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you.